Welcome back everyone to Behind Our Science. We want to thank everyone for your feedback from episode one. We hope you enjoyed it. And we also hope to deliver an even better episode two. The second episode features the introduction to a new member of our team, Vic Meadows. Vic is a trainee member of the ASAP and the HCS. Hello, Behind Our Science. I'm Vic Meadows. I received my Bachelor's of Science in Cell Biology and Spanish from UMHB in Texas. After a few years, I got my Master's of Science in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology from OHSU, and now I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at IU. I'm a proud Venezuelan American and a huge advocate for Latinx and women in STEM. I enjoy gardening, home renovations, and hiking where I can chase all the waterfalls. Also on this episode, we had a fantastic opportunity to speak to Dr. Victor Garcia Martinez. I personally know Dr. Garcia Martinez as part of SACNIS. SACNIS is a society of investment of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in science. I met him during my time as a postdoc at the University of Chapel Hill in North Carolina. I have to say I share a very similar story with Dr. Garcia Martinez since we both were born in Mexico and now we do research here in the United States. Dr. Garcia Martinez shared his amazing story growing up from San Luis Potosí, Mexico to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We are very fortunate to have interviewed him and hope you all enjoy his Behind Our Science. We also want to remind everyone of our giveaways. We have three gift cards to give away. We want to give you free coffee. For the first three people to send us a tweet to add Behind Our Science without the last E with the hashtag Behind Our Science wins. That simple, free coffee. So with nothing more to say, hope you enjoyed episode two. And remember to always believe what is Behind Our Science. <laughs> Dr. Victor Garcia is a professor in the departments of medicine and microbiology and immunology at the University of North Carolina, UNC at Chapel Hill. He has directed a large research laboratory at UNC since 2009. And prior to this, he led a research team at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas. He's a renowned leader in virology research and has developed novel humanized animal models to study virus transmission and prevention. He has expertise in many viruses, including HIV, Zika, Ebola virus, and coronaviruses. His laboratory is focused on discovering novel interventions to treat and prevent the devastating diseases caused by these viruses. Research in viruses has never been more crucial and impactful in our society than in these current times, given the COVID-19 pandemic that has severely affected our lives. In February 2021, Dr. Garcia and his research team published a paper in Nature, on a promising therapy for the treatment and prevention of COVID-19 entitled SARS-CoV-2 infection is effectively treated and prevented by EIDD 2801. We are so honored to have Dr. Garcia on our podcast and are excited to share his story behind the science. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia Martinez for allowing us to interview today and talk about your science, which is the important thing that we're, that we're here to talk. So the first thing that we wanted to ask you about was so we know that you are, we were born in Mexico. We were born in San Luis Potosí, Rio Verde. That's that's where you were born, right? San Luis Potosí. San Luis Potosí. And then, so well, the first question that we wanted to talk to you about was, so your, your career trajectory um, from a Mexican citizen born in Mexico, coming to the U.S. and then transitioning science here in the U.S. How was that like for you? Actually, it was, it was very difficult. Uh, I actually had a very good education in college in Mexico. Uh, I was very, very well trained but my language skills were not uh, up to par to of what you would need to, to, um, to uh, understand the nuances of, of science um, at a very high level like you do in grad school. So it was a struggle and it required a lot of dedication and, and a lot of effort, but uh, nothing that is valuable or long-term useful is, uh, comes to you easy. That created some very strong work ethic that I, I, I've been able to maintain for the rest of my career. Yeah, we know that the transitions are always hard, specifically like language barriers and all, and all those are, are, are hard to transcend. Um, was there something or a strong motivation guiding you into, first of all, science and that you really wanted to pursue here in the U.S.? The number one influence in my life to become a scientist was the fact that I, I actually had a uncle of mine uh, someone that married my mother's sister. He, he was from France, and he was the first scientist I ever met. So he uh, he migrated from from um, Fr France to Canada, 
and then from Canada to Mexico, and he took a, a faculty position at the college where I was. And he was the first scientist that I met. He had the first laboratory that I went to, to see anywhere. And, and from him, I, I got the inspiration to, to become a scientist. Uh, I heard so many incredible stories about the work that he did, the interaction that he had with his students, the struggles that he had to be a scientist, but the rewards of, of, of discovering new compounds, identifying new materials that could in the future contribute to, to the well-being of, of, of humankind. Yeah, that's describing those interactions with your uncle. I actually was really fascinated by what you said, that it's um, the first chemistry set that you had was crystallizing um, copper sulfate. So um, that was really interesting because many of the kids that are growing up, they normally get this, like I, I would do it for, for some of the kids that we, we, we work with for STEM, they always have a story where they, they normally were initiated with some of those toys and mm -hmm. something like that. Was there something else and uh, something else that you found important from your upbringing that, that helped you with the transition and, and then becoming a scientist, a chemist overall? I, I think that it was the uh, uh, mentorship and, and the example that I had, that, as I just described, that made the big difference. Uh, I originally wanted to be a nuclear physicist. Uh, and the only reason I went to be a nuclear physicist is because I had heard about nuclear power and what it could do. Uh, and, and then I, I decided that I wanted to be a nuclear chemist. But, but there was no really place to go and study nuclear chemistry. So um, I decided that chemistry was, uh, was uh, just something that I could do and, and could get me started. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing. I wanted to ask you how your background prepared you and whether it contributed to your determination and uh, success. You were very motivated from super early on and you put a lot of emphasis in your education. So do you think your background prompted you to be successful? Actually, what I think prompted me to, to be successful was the incredible example that I have from my parents. Neither of my parents went to high school. The highest degree of education that I had was elementary school and, and junior high. Both my parents saw the value of education as, as the one thing that they could give all of us uh, as an inheritance that would carry us through the rest of our lives. They knew that they probably couldn't leave us any money, but, but they felt that at, at least they could provide us the opportunity to, to go to school. And so I, I saw my dad work three jobs um, when I was growing up. He, he had literally had three different jobs and, and he had seven children. And, um, and so I never knew anybody that worked harder, but I also saw him be successful. I saw that effort paid and, and that everything that he touched became gold. Uh, in essence, he, I never saw him fail uh, at anything that he did. And I think the reason he never failed is because he worked so hard and he was giving it 100% of his effort to, to what he was doing. But then when I was 19, uh, my father died in a very tragic car accident where 14 children lost their parents. Two people died and each of them had seven children. And then my mother, which uh, was not prepared for it, had to raise all of us. And, and I thought my dad was the most amazing person that I had ever met, um, but I was wrong. The most amazing person that I had ever met was my mother. I just had never seen it. And, and she went from being a housewife to taking over um, some orange grills that, uh, that, that we had and managing them and, and making them forward to become an entrepreneur, uh, to, start, to start businesses, to start construction projects. And then one day out of the blue, in the middle of the night, I got a phone call where she, um, she was calling. And I got really worried because uh, I, I never usually get calls from home in the middle of the night. But, but, but this time she told me, listen, I'm calling you to tell you before uh, you hear it in the news. And I said, oh God, something bad happened. I said like, no, I'm running for Congress. And uh, I don't want you to be surprised. And sure enough, um, she ran for Congress. She was elected to Congress. She served in Congress and then she retired from Congress. And, and so, as I said, um, I have great respect for my dad. He, he was a great person, uh, an outstanding human being, uh, very accomplished, even though he had no education. But then my mother, when she was pushed to her limit, she exceeded everybody else's expectations and, and, and never looked back. And so I, I have the responsibility 
to serve as an example for the rest of my brothers and sisters that were younger. You know, my little sister was three years old when my dad died. So she was a little baby. And, and I knew that, that if I didn't go to college, that if I didn't um, try hard to be a good example for them, maybe they, they would not do it. Your parents are truly remarkable people. Um, I'm just wondering how much of that influenced uh, your career trajectory and how to, um, how you transitioned from your undergraduate degree in Mexico in chemistry and then transitioning into your PhD program um, in Georgetown University and finally establishing your own lab and getting that faculty position currently. Uh, uh, could you tell us a bit more about that uh, transition and how perhaps your upbringing inspired some of these um, decisions? A lot of people ask themselves or, or have somebody that they think about when they want to know if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And to me, is, am I working as hard as my father worked? And would he be proud of me? Am I meeting his expectations, not only professionally, but also as a human being, as a person? Would, would, would he... Would, would I embarrass him or, or, or would he take pride on what I what I don't and what I'm doing? And, and again, that's that's the the, the way in which I, I kind of like get my bearings. Um, if, if I don't think that uh, something that I am doing would measure to those standards, I, I, I need to change it and, and make it and make it better. But but then the, the other motivation is I didn't want to fail because if I did. Um, I might be setting a bad precedent for my six brothers and sisters. And, and I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want that for, for them. And, and, and I do believe that, that when you work hard, you are rewarded. But, but, but you actually have to be smart when you work hard. In essence, working without direction or without knowing where, where you're going and what are your ultimate goals gets you nowhere. Uh, you, you have to have very specific goals. It, it might be just graduating from college or it might be graduating from grad school, or it might be just getting a postdoc, or it might be just getting a, a, a faculty position. But when you have a goal, then you have the parameters that are required to, to be able to accomplish that goal. And you know, something I tell my students and postdocs and, and anybody who trains under me is there will always be a job for those in the top 10% of anything. It doesn't matter what you do, whether you make shoes or basketballs or, 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 or you, 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 you grow uh, vegetables. If you have the best products, if you have the best uh, shoes, you have the best balls, the, uh, uh, people come and buy them. And so when you're doing science like we do now, uh, the question that I tell them they need to ask themselves is who is going to care about what you're doing beyond yourself? Is this going to be something that people are going to say, whoa, this is really important, we need to listen to it. And will people say, is well done? Or would they say, well, yeah, it's kind of an interesting story, but, 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 but it's not the maximum that somebody could get. And, and if somebody asked me to characterize what we do, I would say, we try to do things that are really difficult, that take a long time to do, that nobody else wants to do because they're too expensive and because they represent a significant risk. But at the end of the day, those end up being the most significant contributions that we can make. And so we need to have that focus and, and then things will come out right. Yes, thank, thank you for, for all of those. I mean, it's, it's fantastic to hear the story. And again, I think we all relate. Me as, as coming from Mexico, I, I completely get the whole um, background and how it determines your your, um, your path. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit also about your research overall. So I wanted to, the first question that I, or topic that I, we would like to hear is, is specifically from you is, so I know that you're a virologist, you do um, AIDS research, but um, what, do you, what do you consider the main research focus in your lab right now? Okay. Well, right now we're spending an inordinate amount of time doing COVID research. And, uh, and the reason we're doing that is because it's, it's the crisis that is present. So, so, so when, when I was in, in grad school, people discover a, a new syndrome that was afflicting a certain groups of our society and uh, it, it was killing them. Uh, but it was too early in my career to be able to contribute to that that became the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. And, and so in the very early, AIDS of the, uh, early days of the AIDS epidemic, I knew about it, but, but, but I did not contribute. It, it took me about, I don't know, three or four years after my PhD 
to decide, okay, this is where I want to make a, a dent. But this time, I, I felt I was in a unique position to be able to contribute in a meaningful way to a new problem, the new, the new crisis that, was, that, that humanity was facing. And, and I was motivated by necessity. In essence, we were told, you have to go home and you cannot come to work. We're going to close the school and the only people that are going to be uh, able to stay and continue their programs are those people that are working on, on COVID. And so as soon as I heard that, I said, I'm working on COVID. But, but you know, luck helps those that are prepared. It just so happens that um, it's going to be two years ago, we had uh, uh, developed a model that incorporated human lung tissue implanted on, on the back of, of immune deficient mice. So these mice have human lungs literally in their backs. And uh, we wanted to publish those results, but we didn't want it to publish in just uh, any journal or in any, any, any form. We wanted to make an imprint of, of how, how powerful these models would be. And so we took, uh, I believe, seven or nine different pathogens and, and from disparate places. And, and we just started infecting those animals with those pathogens. And they included things like Zika, uh, respiratory syncytia virus, human cytomegalovirus, uh, uh, et cetera. And one of the pathogens that we infected the animals with was Middle Eastern um, respiratory coronavirus, MERS. And, uh, and that's a coronavirus. And the virus replicated really well in this model. So we, we published our paper and we were waiting for uh, what would be the next good virus that we could use to study in, in, in this model. And so when, when the new coronavirus came out, we had the perfect model to uh, study it in vivo. And, uh, and that's the latest paper that we published. And, and you know, that, that paper is just the, 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 the down payment on a, a series of work that is, is going to be coming that takes advantage of, of those models that, that um, is going to shed um, light into not only um, therapeutic and preventative approaches, but also to the basic uh, changes that occur after viral infection that result in the pathogenesis that we see in humans. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That, that's incredible. And it shows how uh, research relies on prior research and that's how innovation happens. So, uh, Dr. Garcia, you talked about a little bit about COVID, and it sounds like you were doing um, COVID research even before the pandemic. But can you think of ways that your lab has been affected by the pandemic uh, moving forward? Um, are there things that you are going to be doing differently from now on? And what do you think the effect of the pandemic has been in research and in labs in general? Well, the, the first thing that I can tell you is that our productivity plummeted. Our productivity went from 100 to like 30 because we couldn't come to work. Uh, and, and, and in many instances, we were uh, very fortunate that some of the uh, work that we had been doing, we were allowed to continue until it ended um, because some of the models that we work with take uh, up to six months to prepare. So if we were to stop our experiments, we would set back not, not six months, but actually probably a year or two on the work that we had been doing. So we were allowed to finish some experiments and, and that was actually very, very important. But th the other thing that was um, very difficult was that even when they let people come back in, we had to maintain a certain level of density. And, 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 it, and we pride ourselves. We, we really take very strong pride in working as a team. Uh, everybody depends on each other. We do massive experiments that not a single person could do. So but having um, a group of people come together and help each other doing the experiments is the, the center, most important quality that we have as a group. And so when, when we were told that we couldn't have the density that we normally have, everything went up crazy for us because we could not perform uh, the harvest that we needed. We couldn't perform the analysis that we needed. Um, we, we were in a, um, in a very difficult situation for, for, for a while. And the other thing that happened was that we, we rely on core laboratories. A lot of the core laboratories were also having uh, to deal with the same problems. But I have to say that, that um, the, the cores that we use for our, our, our COVID papers, all of them came through for us. And that's another very important thing about science is we're a team, 
in our in our laboratory, everybody works together on all the aspects of our work. But we're also a team with our colleagues, both at UNC and outside. And they had to come um, together uh, despite the crisis in order to be able to, to complete the task that needed to be completed. And, and things that we do now differently it, um, include uh, having to reorganize how uh, we do our experiments in such a way that so, some individuals can start, start the tasks very early in the morning and then leave uh, them ready for the next set of people to come in and continue. And, uh, and we, have to, we have learned to trust that other individuals can do as good of a job as we can. Because sometimes we believe that the only person in the lab that can do a certain thing is us. And, and we don't want to let go. And in this case, we had to let go. We had to let somebody else do it. But, but, the, but the other thing that, um, that is uh, important is, is that we, we try to create um, redundancy in, in our group so that there is not only one person that can do a certain task, uh, that, that we have multiple people that can step in and help on any given task. And, and, and if I was gonna give some advice to, to a young investigator or a young postdoc or, or somebody in transition, as far as what can help you be successful is you need to be flexible. If you are not flexible, you're gonna suffer a lot. You need to be able to go with the flow and accept the new conditions as they are and embrace them and move your, your work forward. Um, because if you get stuck on, in, on, on, on how you normally do things and never change, uh, that's gonna come back and, and hunt you. And I think one of the, the, the reasons that we've been very successful in many different areas, not only on COVID, but even in the HIV AIDS area that we do, is that we can spin on a, on a dime. We, we, we can just turn directions in an instant when we see an opportunity or, or when we realize that a line of, of thinking that we have been pursuing is not going to yield the, the, the goals that we anticipated. You need to, to not be enamored with what you're doing to the extent that it, is, it becomes to your detriment. Yeah, being flexible, I think, is the best advice for not just for researchers, but in general. I think if the pandemic teaches us something, if it's that, then at least we come out winning for the next challenge that we're going to be facing. Right, exactly. A huge congratulations on the recent Nature paper. Um, it's super exciting to uh, see the work and the promising role of um, the drug uh, EIDD2801. And basically, um, we were just really curious about how the story behind that, uh, how that paper came together and like how um, you came to focus on this particular drug and uh, tell us a bit about that. Well, I'm happy, happy to do that. And um, again, it's one of those things that uh, flexibility is what makes a difference. So, so we, we have this model and, uh, and we know it could be useful. So we had to show that the virus could replicate. And, and, and we were able to show that the, the virus replicates. And, and once we show the virus replicated, we can look at the pathogenesis. Uh, and, and, and you know we documented that very, very clearly. But, but then we needed to know how it was happening. So we did some sequencing analysis and, and we were able to see what, things, what genes go up, which genes go down. And we were able to show that the interference response was very important, but that wasn't gonna get it into nature. You know, that was a solid story, but, but, but it wasn't gonna get it into nature. So we needed to have a hook, something that it was going to uh, really rise the level of, of significance of the paper. And, and we had two stories that we could follow. One was the next pandemic. A question that, that we wanted to answer was, are there viruses in nature that can come like this virus into the human population? And do they need to have a uh, intermediary host? So we were able to, to, to work with our, our colleagues here at, at, at UNC, Ralph Barrick and, and Lisa Granlinski, and they happen to have bad viruses that have not made it across to humans. So we, we, we challenged our animals with those bad viruses and the bad viruses replicated. So we, we concluded that some of these viruses present in nature could come directly from the bats into humans without having to go to intermediate uh, uh, species and that this could start all over again. Uh, that it, it, we can have another pandemic like in the next few years or the next 10 years. So we thought that was really important. But we also knew that the model could be very useful to test drugs. And so we, we went out and looked at all the lists of drugs that people were that, that proposing to, to, to test uh, 
for, for COVID. And um, of course, the, the, the number one drug that we could have tested was remdesivir uh, because it was the drug that was already being proposed to be in clinical uh, application. But it just so happens we had already tested remdesivir for MERS two years early. So we were familiar with the drug, we were familiar with everything. And we also knew that remdesivir is rendered inactive by esterases present in mice, particularly in the plasma. So we really couldn't do much experiments with remdesivir. And so that was out of the question. So then the other obvious candidate was the plasma from humans, uh, convalescent plasma, okay? So, so we got, uh, I don't know, four, five, six drugs and we, um, and we tested them. And the only one that worked was uh, EADD2801. And, and when I say work, it worked beyond our expectations. I mean, uh, the reductions in, in viral load in, in the animals that were treated with a drug with pre-exposure prophylaxis were four orders of magnitude. In essence, the, the, the reduction was 10,000 to one. There had not been any paper published so far that had seen a more than one, one and a half log reduction in, in viral, viral, viral replication, viral load. And, and we were seeing that amplified almost a thousand times. So we knew we had something really, really good. And so with that in hand, we talked to the editor of Nature and, and they were interested in the paper, but she gave me a very good piece of advice. She said, I'm gonna send the paper out for review, but be prepared because the reviewers are gonna to wanna to see a treatment. And I said, no problem. So sure enough, we sent the paper out, the reviews were very complimentary, but the paper got rejected. And you know why it got rejected? Because we didn't have treatment. No. <laughs> so, so, so the paper got rejected because we didn't have treatment. So I uh, immediately emailed back the editors and, and I said, thank you very much for, for, for your kind letter and for the reviewers' comments. But in your letter, you state that the reason you're rejecting the paper is because we don't have treatment. But you had already told us that. And so we already did the experiments and we can get these results to you within the next two to four weeks. Can you reconsider the paper? Yeah. And, and, and they thought about it for a week and then they came back and they said, yes, we will reconsider the paper if you had the treatment. So the results of the treatment show that if you treat the animals 48 hours after infection, you can reduce viral loads by 96%. We answered all the questions that they had and, uh, and we sent it back and the, the rest is history. But another piece of advice that I was given to, that was actually was given to us because I had invited somebody to come and give a talk at UNC and some postdocs and grad students came to the talk and, and that person, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, what he told them was, above all, don't give up. Don't take no for an answer. So this is a perfect example of how we didn't take no for an answer. And we were able to, to uh, produce what was necessary to be produced in order to, be, to, to get this nature paper. But, but I have to say, we're not new to this. This was our third nature paper in the last year. My people believe that they can have a nature paper. They, they have no doubt that if, if they do the work, if, if they ask the hard questions, if, if they go beyond what is expected for them to do, they can achieve this level of success. So th th that's something that they will take away with them when they move on to their next job, th that, that they can uh, reach to heights that uh, other people dream of and that they can see them become reality. Wow, I, I have no words. <laughs> it's so inspiring. Yeah. I, I am in that category of, I would dream of having an HMA paper, so hopefully <laughs> one day. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, you, you have to be in an environment that is going to encourage you to dare. And, and, and you know, we, we have a, a, a young woman just joined our group um, and um, she came to see me and told me what she was gonna do, et cetera. And, and I told her, I want you to go out there and challenge everybody. I want you to go out there and, and, and take it to the next level. I want you to go out there and take any risk you wanna take to bring this story to fruition. And I, I almost saw tears in her eyes because she told me, this is so refreshing. I, I was chastised for doing 
exactly what you're asking me to do in my previous place. In my previous place, there was no room for that. Mm -hmm. And for you to tell me to be myself, to be free, to, 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 to really take it on and to know that even if I fail, you'll be there for me, you'll have my back, that's just unbelievable. But that's what all young scientists need to hear. That's exactly what they've been encouraged to do. That, that's what, what, what is going to create the, the, the daring that is necessary to, to be able to be successful. Yeah, I, I think supporting young researchers, whatever the state of their careers mm -hmm. or even um, th their ability to, to appreciate it at the moment is the most important thing. Support is needed and mentorship starts there by allowing people to be free and pursue their goals and maybe they'll end up having a nature paper. <laughs> <That's> right, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, the bottom line is that I, I, um, I am not going to be the first author of any nature paper anymore. It's going to be you or you or you that is going to be the first author of those papers. Uh, I'll be relegated to the back end or somewhere in that part of the paper. But um, um, but you have to have the desire and, and you and you have to have uh, the willingness to to work really hard for it and, and not to be deterred. Because, you know, so, so people don't have it. And, and, and it's not that they don't have the skills, but they don't have the determination. And, and they're not willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary to be able to succeed at this level. And the sacrifices are, are great. Uh, you know, they're very difficult. Um, but if, if, if you're not willing to make them, you, you might not, um, not, not, might not be able to, to, to see it through. And you also have to believe the people that are mentoring you. Okay, so you have mentors, and you should have many mentors, not just one mentor, but many mentors. But, but you have to believe them. And if, and if you don't trust them, that, are, that they have your best interest at heart, then, then it's not gonna work. Th that paper that we had um, with, the, uh, um, with the human lung implants, the first paper we had, that paper was the culmination of work of, of, a, of a young uh, assistant professor here at, at UNC. And uh, that paper was submitted to Nature Medicine and, and it was rejected from Nature Medicine. And, and I have to say that some people thought you couldn't publish in Nature Medicine. Okay, that it was, it was like a vindication to, to them that, that we have failed. And so when, when this person came to me and says, what do we do now? We make it better and we send it to sell. And, 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 and I, I get the impression that, um, that, that at first you were like, huh? <laughs> we were just rejected from Nature Medicine and now you want to go out to sell? And I said, yeah, let, let's see if we can get into sell. And we went through the whole rigmarole of, of trying to get it ready for sell. And, and we spoke to the editor and, and the editor told us something that, that I, I I didn't quite like uh, not not because it was wrong but but because I, I didn't think that that our paths were going to meet such that we were able to to get that through them the first author of the paper was was ready to just go one step down and I said no let's send it to Nature uh, Biotechnology and she goes and looks at it and Nature Biotechnology has a higher impact than Nature Medicine so so it's again it's like our paper kind of rejected that how, how are we going to get it here he said we're going to make it better and we're gonna do everything that is necessary to get it there and it will come out. And, and sure enough, it came out in Nature Biotechnology. And it's a great paper, it's, it's, it's a piece of art. Uh, and, um, and I'm very proud of her. And it just so happens, is the same first author of this latest Nature paper. But see, she, she overcame the, the rejection, not one time, but two times, three times, four times. And now what did she have to her, to her record? She has a nature biotech paper, she has a nature paper, and then she's co-author on the other two nature papers. So uh, she stuck with it, she never gave up. She, she's somebody that I now I admire greatly for her determination to, to see it through. Yeah, another example of perseverance. So uh, Dr. Garcia, you mentioned COVID uh, a lot and how can we avoid talking about COVID um, in today's world? But do you think there's gonna be uh, a post-COVID era and potentially a future pandemic. How do you think that uh, scientists, us who are doing research now, how can we prepare to meaningfully contribute to the next pandemic? I, I think that uh, the next pandemic is in inevitable. As I think that as we encroach into nature, nature is going to encroach into us. And so there's a coronavirus pandemic every 10 years. Uh, there, there's a flu pandemic just um, waiting to happen, and we were really close a few years ago with the with the previous influenza pan pandemic that didn't materialize in, into something as horrible as it could have been. But um, but I think that's coming. So so how do we prepare ourselves? Well, I think that we learn from our lessons, 
And, and, and I think what's going to be most important is that we continue to show leadership to the rest of society, but, but leadership that can be trusted, leadership that is based on facts. It's something that um, we, we do with the highest possible quality, with, with rigor and reproducibility, so, so that we, we're not like, like a match that you, you light up and it flares and then it disappears. We want to be something that is going to be bright, but it was going to continue providing light to society all the time so, so that they can trust us and, and believe that if we tell them, hey, wait a second, this could be really bad. We need to be prepared uh, that they will heed that advice. And, and also we need to, to, to realize that globally uh, there are many players. We're not the only players. There are good scientists all over the world and, and there are um, other individuals that are able to contribute. And, and for example, uh, in the early days when, when there was a need for a COVID test, you know, there were international groups that had COVID tests and, and our leadership budged it. I mean, it, it, was, it was really bad. So to what extent that, that determined what happened subsequently, uh, who knows? But I remember when the AIDS epidemic started and how the federal government really was not interested in doing anything about it. And it became the pandemic that we live with it today. But you know, people don't think of AIDS anymore now. They think about COVID. Well, the time will come when they will think about the next thing. They will forget about COVID. I don't wanna, I don't know if I should be optimistic or pessimistic about this. Well, I think you should be really optimistic if you're a scientist. I think if you're a scientist, this, there's never been a better time to be a scientist. Sounds like you're an advocate for science communication. Well, I think science communication is really important. I, I think that uh, being able to, to tell people the story is, 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 is a responsibility that we all have, but, but we have to do it not for our personal reasons of becoming important, but because we truly believe that, that, that there's something that is important for society to know. Actually, as a scientist, my leg uh, the legacy I, I, I would like to have is for my two little daughters to grow up to be productive members of society because I can't I can't uh, dissociate who I am as a scientist um, from being a parent um, and from being a regular member of society so the most important thing for me is their future and uh, and how I can help them be good citizens and, and contribute to, 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 to society yeah that's that's fantastic my, my, my son uh, one of the greatest feelings that I have is my son told me like a couple of months ago, he wanted to be a scientist. And I started tearing up. And because he was excited about the American Heart Association fundraising. So he was excited about that. And I told him, oh, so I'm, I'm a committee member. And his face like just light up. And I was so excited. Um, so I'm really happy about this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the other things you wanted to showcase, if you have a minute, is um, are there opportunities in your lab? What other things are you looking to more people to get involved in your group or people that are w wanting or willing to look up at the work that you're doing and try to do those as well. well actually, the, the, the next good start is going to come from whoever comes into the laboratory. We uh, are here to provide an environment where people can use the, their God-given talents to the best of their ability. And my job is to be a cheerleader, to help them succeed. And uh, the projects that we have here uh, are so different. Uh, we have projects on influenza, on um, other viruses like uh, respiratory syncytial virus, cytomegalovirus, HIV, Zika, um, COVID. Uh, we have a gene therapy projects. Uh, we have a, a lot of different leads that we're taking that take advantage of the core technology that we invented. And that's the, the humanized mice models that, that, that we have here. And so if, if there's any um, anything that we can use them for or any new models that we can invent and develop, uh, that's, that's all open. But we're always looking for individuals that are, are interested in learning and uh, contributing as, as much as they can. No es la respuesta incorrecta. Siempre se puede. Lo único que hay que hacer es encontrarle la manera. Pero no hay, que, no hay que rendirse ante la adversidad, sino que hay que seguir adelante y echarle más ganas. Y entre más ganas y esfuerzo uno leche, la, la, la posibilidad de, de, de obtener el éxito es más grande. Gracias. No nos lo agradecemos. Thank you for your time, Dr. Garcia. It was fantastic, fantastic talk. <laughs> We are very excited to highlight the Journal of Histochemistry and Cytochemistry's May 2021 Editor's Choice paper. 
The first step for diagnosis of tumors involves testing the tissue that is obtained after surgery for various protein markers, allowing for specific diagnosis. These tests are called immunohistochemistry and are done by pathologists. They are very important for patient care as immunohistochemistry results often help cancer doctors make a decision on treatment. This paper highlights the work under National Cancer Institute's Biospecimen Pre-Analytical Variable Program. Aditi Bakshi and the co-authors highlight the importance of standardizing the pre-analytical variables for accurate immunohistochemistry results that leads to a high quality care for cancer patients. This exciting article is available free online on the Journal of Histochemistry and Cytochemistry's website. Our next manuscript highlight from the Journal of Histochemistry and Cytochemistry is work done by Edward Dedkov. The present findings demonstrate that at least during the first two weeks after myocardial infarction, the remaining arterial vessels are able to maintain their normal structure and patency that makes them suitable to serve as endogenous routes for re-establishing the arterial blood flow. Keep a lookout for this manuscript as it becomes available on the website of the Journal of Histochemistry and Cytochemistry. Did you know that viral infections like the flu can cause an activation of your immune cells? This is one of the targets that Harshini Kayashar and their co-authors inhibited in order to find a therapeutic for patients. They found that chemokine receptor antagonist combined with an antiviral drug is able to reduce morbidity, mortality, and viral number in two influenza infection models. The authors used various biochemical and molecular biology techniques like immunoblotting and immunostaining to find decreased viral number, chemokine receptor expression, and restored normal lung architecture in the dual treatment groups. This is very promising, and for more details, check out the latest issue of the American Journal of Pathology for April 2021. The next article highlight from the American Journal of Pathology is hot off the press. It was made available online on March 19, 2021. Ming Xian Wu and their co-authors found that the liver has an inherent expression of interferon 1, which allows it to have the regenerative capabilities that we know and love. However, this is a double-edged sword. This inherent expression of interferon 1 increases cell proliferation and hepatocellular carcinoma formation, the most common cancer that affects the liver. The authors were able to remove receptor expression and found that reduced interferon 1 is able to reduce cell proliferation and hepatocellular carcinoma formation. They also found very interesting results that indicated that interferon 1 is able to play a role in glucose and lipid metabolism which is very important for researchers that are looking to find therapeutics to prevent hepatocellular carcinoma formation. For more details, visit the American Journal of Pathology website.